Combining Sentences 2, Dependent Phrases and Clauses, a podcast webcast for BCC iTunes U by George Weinschenk. When we arrive at college, we may think that we know how ideas can be joined smoothly and seamlessly. However, the style begins to shine when dependent clauses are brought to bear. The most sophisticated means of combining sentences or independent clauses is to turn one of them into a dependent clause or phrase. Dependent clauses cannot stand by themselves as sentences. Thus, to turn an independent clause into a dependent clause requires some finessing. Through practice, you will find, though, that with these forms, you can combine sentences in a way that provides the greatest ease for reading. In the previous podcast webcast, we discussed the potential for using conjunctions and punctuation in combining sentences. Now we will discuss the means of using dependent clauses and phrases. These strategies include appositives, relative clauses, prepositional phrases, participial phrases, and absolute phrases. The relative clause uses one of the following words, which, that, who, whose, and whom. With one of these relative pronouns, one of the sentences to be combined is made dependent upon another independent clause. The cat lapped up the milk, the cat loves milk most of all, can be replaced by using the second sentence to describe the milk in the first. The cat lapped up the milk, which it loves most of all. Which is used instead of that in cases where the meaning of the relative clause is not needed to make sense out of the independent clause. When the meaning of the relative clause is needed, you have a choice between which and that, though that is preferred in such cases. The sentences, the cat lapped up the milk, the cat loves milk most of all, can become, the cat lapped up the milk which it loves most of all, or, the cat lapped up the milk that it loves most of all. Remember that the that is never preceded by a comma. That is used in cases where we need to identify the person or thing that is modified. When we have, the cat lapped up the milk, the cat knocked over the bowl, we can describe the cat with a relative clause beginning with which. The cat, which lapped up the milk, knocked over the bowl. In this case, the relative clause beginning with which is separated from the rest of the sentence by commas, indicating that this information is relatively unimportant to the overall sentence. However, when we write to identify the cat, the cat that lapped up the milk knocked over the bowl, we have identified the cat as the culprit that has made the mess. Notice that no comma appears before a that or before a which when the relative clause here that lapped up the milk is necessary for the meaning of the sentence here to identify which cat knocked over the bowl. When, on the other hand, a which appears in mid-sentence that supplies merely descriptive information, the relative clause is to be surrounded by commas to indicate that it can be painlessly extracted. If the cat is a pet, then the pet should be referred to, like a person, with a who. Floofy, who loves milk most of all, lapped up her feast. If, on the other hand, the relative clause is necessary, to identify which pet cat, then the relative clause would not be surrounded by commas, as in the following sentence. The cat who lapped up the milk knocked over the bowl. If the relative clause is being used to identify her as the owner of her drink, then the relative pronoun whose should be used. The cat whose milk splattered across the floor lapped up her mess eagerly. Whose should be used in both cases of the cat being a pet or just a generic cat, even when the thing possessing is not alive or inanimate. Whose should be used? After all, the word witches does not exist in the English language. The bowl whose milk lay splattered across the floor wobbled back and forth. The relative pronoun whom should be reserved for those occasions when the subject of the relative clause which above was first the cat and was then the bowl, is an indirect object of some verb. In these cases, relative pronouns are to be preceded by a preposition. The cat for whom the milk was intended lapped up every last drop. Notice that a preposition, at, to, from, for, 
introduces this last type of relative clause. The verb intend sometimes requires prepositions to convey its meaning. Can you think of other verbs that require prepositions before their indirect objects? To keep these last three types of relative pronouns distinct in your memory, try reciting the following question that might arise at a post office. Who mailed whose package to whom? That last example involving an indirect object relative clause could also be considered another kind of dependent clause called a prepositional phrase, so named after the preposition that begins it. Prepositional phrases are as common as the prepositions that they use. The list of prepositions is long. Consider these, across, around, near, beyond, and during. Usually prepositions indicate position in space, but sometimes they also indicate position in sequence or time. So common are prepositional phrases that we rarely even notice them as separate from the independent clauses upon which they depend. So much do they depend and are they depended upon that they are rarely surrounded by commas, though sometimes commas are added to help a reader keep track of the main point of a sentence. For example, consider this sentence. From its place under the bed sheet, the cat made fixing the bed impossible. The comma here helps to keep the readers from getting confused by reading the two nouns, the bed sheet, the cat, side by side. Usually commas will not be necessary, as in the following example. In the corner, the cat sat to lick its paws. Notice that the prepositional phrase needs to be adjacent or next to the thing that it describes. If we were to rewrite that last sentence, we would have a different sense. The cat sat to lick its paws in the corner. Though this sentence might be correct, its readers might hesitate to ponder if the corner is where the cat keeps its paws. Such careless constructions might make a reader read the sentence over and over and over, wondering what the writer is implying. Thus the sentence could be said to scan poorly. This issue of word order is especially important to the next category of dependent phrases, the participial phrase. So named because it begins with a participle, the participial phrase is a type of verb phrase. The participle is the second part of a two-word verb in which the first word is an auxiliary verb, like is or has, also known as a copula. In the examples has taken, is leaving, has jumped, and is thrown, the second word is a participle, ending with ing, ed, en, n, or t. Participial phrases need always to be surrounded by commas and can appear at any point in a sentence with one stipulation. They must appear adjacent or next to the things they are talking about. Given the two sentences, the young boy was shaken by the fall. He looked up at his pony. We can combine them as shaken by the fall. The young boy looked up at his pony. This sentence, however, would make no logical sense if it were written differently. The young boy looked up at his pony, shaken by the fall. Can you see why? Again, we can see this need for a particular word order in other examples. The car, slipping on the slick asphalt, heaved to the side of the road, would make no sense if it were rewritten as, the car heaved to the side of the road, slipping on the asphalt. A reader would get stuck on this sentence, wondering, how could a road slip? especially on itself. Note that a participial phrase may seem strange when the participle is itself preceded by an adverb, as in this sentence. Slowly slipping from his saddle, the boy made one last desperate reach for his pony's mane. The adverb slowly describes the verb slipping, which is here a participle used to introduce a participial phrase. Similarly, an appositive needs to be kept adjacent to its referent. An appositive is a noun phrase used to describe another noun in an independent clause. When faced with the two sentences, the pony was a thoroughbred from upstate, the pony looked back at the boy with a keen sense of sorrow. We can combine them into a single sentence by turning one of the sentences into a noun phrase called an appositive. The pony, a thoroughbred from upstate, looked back at the boy with a keen sense of sorrow. 
Notice that the appositive noun phrase needs to be surrounded by commas since it is removable, as are all appositives that are not part of a title like Kermit the Frog. The last method of combining two independent clauses by making one of them dependent uses an absolute phrase. This method is difficult, perhaps because the absolute phrase modifies not a particular part of a sentence, but the entire sentence. As opposed to the previous types which needed to be located right next to where they described, absolute phrases can appear at any point in the sentence. Absolute phrases are constructed in two ways, by combining a noun and an adjective, and by combining a noun and a participle. For example, his hands were hard and worn. He pushed that plow until nightfall. Can be combined by applying the first method for making one an absolute phrase, joining a noun and an adjective. His hands hard and worn. He pushed that plow until nightfall. The peculiar quality of this kind of dependent clause is that it need not be placed next to anything in particular in the sentence. Thus, he pushed that plow until nightfall, his hands hard and worn, works just as well and perhaps with more dramatic emphasis. The other method of combining a noun with a participle might go something like this. The two sentences, the horse was foaming with sweat, the farmer's plow bucked at each overturned stone, could be joined so. His horse foaming with sweat, the farmer's plow bucked at each overturned stone. If the two clauses are interchanged, however, the farmer's plow bucked at each overturned stone, his horse foaming with sweat, the construction seems awkward. The reason for the discomfort of this word order may be the presence of the participle, which in a participial phrase would need to be adjacent to its referent. This last class of dependent clause is truly the stuff of advanced college courses. Perhaps it is even poetic. At any rate, absolute phrases are difficult to use, so difficult that your college instructor might mistake them for incorrect sentences that contain dangling modifiers. Please be kind to your instructor if you catch them in this error. At the end of the track, we can remember the methods we've tried for combining sentences. Conjunctions, such as coordinating conjunctions, subordinating conjunctions, and conjunctive adverbs. Punctuation, such as using semicolons, colons, dashes, and parentheses. And dependent phrases and clauses, such as relative clauses, prepositional phrases, participial phrases, appositives, and absolute phrases. You will have to select the methods for combining sentences that best fit each of your writing contexts according to the considerations of formality, style, and meaning. The train from Conjunction Junction leaves off here, dumping its luggage at the station for you to claim as your own what you will. Not all methods for combining sentences or independent clauses will appeal to you. Whichever techniques you do choose, please make it a point to alternate between them so that your readers will be able to pay attention to your message without becoming distracted by unintended patterns on the page.